This isn't a world that anyone with any sense stays in or spends much time worrying about. You're living in a carnival, throwing little plastic rings at oversized pop bottles, hoping to win a prize. What are you gonna win? A two week vacation? A new car? A little money to retire on? It's all just a shitty, sawdust filled rabbit. The things you care about are useless where we're going. Indeed, you are right. Oh, breakaway civilization technocrat from the film Under the Silver Lake. Even as the Andrew Garfield character, after hearing you, just won't let go of the material poppycock that keeps humans bound to Mithra's abode. But we are getting out, way out. For we understand those infinite things and have found that despised philosopher's stone buried in the mud. As we linger here with the god in the gutter of Philip K. Dick. As Jean Cocteau wrote in The Infernal Machine, Mystery has its own mysteries, and there are gods above gods. We have ours, they have theirs. That is what's known as infinity. The light that burns twice as bright burns half as long. Or are we getting out? Are we ready? Or are we still trapped in the wheel of birth and rebirth, round and round the spine of the Ouroboros? Is there even reincarnation? Good question to anyone but the Andrew Garfield character in Under the Silver Lake who won't listen to the breakaway civilization technocrat. The Gnostic Way is endless speculation through endless labyrinths of myth, magic, and meaning. We can talk about anything as long as we experience the all. In this eternal now, we will be proving reincarnation. At least our astral guest will. All this has happened before, and will happen again. 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 Welcome to Aeon Bite Gnostic Radio. Welcome to the machine, my son, and the means to escape it. Welcome to that dream of you, that distant ship smoke on the horizon. We don't take prisoners but liberate them. Divided we stand, together we rise. Even as we rage against heaven and storm the gates of hell for our misplaced childhoods and paradises lost. I mean, sex is good, but have you ever fucked over the establishment? That's what we're doing, because the awakening of any individual is a cosmic rebellion. Fuck you, and fuck the establishment, and fuck you people who are trying to make me part of the unestablished establishment. So honored you are here, and honored to serve you. My name is Miguel Connor, your pompadus of gnosis and smell of colitas rising up through the air of a world gone mad by the flatulence of a creator god gorged with the stolen dreams of the eternal realm. Our father, which art in heaven. Let him fucking stay there. Yes, back to reincarnation. Does it happen? According to Stephen Secularius, it does indeed. He'll be discussing at the Virtual Alexandria his book. Reincarnation can be proven, 
an overview of Matthew Franklin Whittier's return as the author, Stephen Secularius, and a look at Whittier's secret literary legacy. Stephen will take us on a fascinating yet sober journey on how he discovered he was Matthew Franklin Whittier, providing you with the techniques and insights on how you can perhaps access your past lives. Bigly Interview, where Stephen goes beyond reincarnation to offer intriguing revelations on such literary and occult giants like Edgar Allan Poe, Charles Dickens, Albert Pike, and several spiritualist luminaries from the 19th century. We speculate on this and everything else because we are Gnostic-minded as we run with those searching for the truth and avoid those who have found it. What is it to transcend? To recognize nothing is true and everything is permitted. But did the Gnostics believe in the transmigration of the souls? As always, it's complicated and so different from all other faiths. But we can certainly say they viewed any reincarnation as part of the machinery and machinations of the Archons. Eternal forgetfulness, blue-pilling the divine spark of every being across the multiverse. You felt it your entire life, that there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind, driving you mad. The earliest form of reincarnation in Gnostic lore, if you don't include the cult of Orpheus, is with the father of all heresies and Gnosticism himself, Simon Magus. In the Simonian myth, Faust, as he sometimes was called, was God incarnate, traveling across history in search of Helen, or his first thought and co-creator. Ellen was kidnapped by renegade, Epstein-like angels at the beginning of time and hidden in the world of forms, forced to reincarnate in various meat sacks, including Ellen of Troy. Simon eventually found Ellen, and their union not only symbolizes the completion of humans after long quests through birth and rebirth, but the individuation of the divine in its process of self-discovery. By the power of truth, I, while living, have conquered the universe. Personal motto? From Faust. That's about trying to cheat the devil, isn't it? Later Gnostic sages would provide their versions of reincarnation. In the second century, Basilides of Alexandria taught that Gnosis was the climax of many lives of effort, indicating a Gnostic version of karma. For example, he said, quote, Men suffer from their deeds in former lives. Money's hell is different. It's not all fire and pain. The real hell is your life gone wrong. His contemporary, Carpocrates of Alexandria, believed in the transmigration of souls, but very differently from Basilides. Claiming that humans could not escape the Ouroboros until they underwent every physical experience possible and became wary of the material world. Later, the Persian Mazdakites and Frankian Jews would take up this libertine vibe. Have you ever been in a, in a Turkish prison? The Sethian, the secret book of John, has a theology that echoes the Eastern Bodhisattva vow. Jesus explains to the Apostle John that human souls are recycled by the Demiurge, constantly thrown into... Quote, forgetfulness in prisons. Jesus further says that to escape, the soul needs to quote, follow another soul in whom the spirit of life dwells, because she is saved through the spirit. Then she will never be thrust into flesh again. 
I reveal myself to myself and I am drenched and purged. Other Gnostic texts like Zoroastrianos and the Pista Sophia talk about forms of reincarnation in the flesh or in other dimensions with pit stops in temporary heavens or hells. Always in a long saga of perfecting Gnosis. You're not your job. You're not how much money you have in the bank. You're not the car you drive. You're not the contents of your wallet. You're not your fucking khakis. Interestingly, the Gospel of Thomas provides a passage that alludes to the potential of past life recollection. It goes, When you see your likeness, you are happy. But when you see your images that came into being before and that neither die nor become visible, how much will you bear? If I'm not me, who the hell am I? The Manichaeans universally believed in reincarnation. And against the Manichaeans, Augustine's description of the Manichaean attitude on reincarnation is similar to the Hindu concept of spirits transmigrating into life forms other than human. Augustine wrote, quote, They believe that the herbs and the trees are alive, and the life that is in them is endowed with sensibility and able to suffer when hurt. This is why no one can severe or pluck anything without inflicting suffering upon it. Gee, those world-hating Gnostics seem always to be so eco-friendly, I keep saying. Gosh, anti-cosmic dualism just has a way of bringing out, well, cosmic empathy. But whatever. We're all in it together, kid. Except for the Mandeans, who divorced the notion of reincarnation centuries ago, we can go on and on with Gnostic attitudes on reincarnation. From the Valentinians to the Yazidi, to the Cathars, to the Sufis, to the Ismailis, to the Lurianic Kabbalists, and so forth. The difference from other faiths is the Byzantine structures that just don't go forward, but back and beyond and out and into a million worlds in that almost endless game of Saturn. You see, to be quite frank, Kevin, the fabric of the universe is far from perfect. It was a bit of a botched job, you see. We only had seven days to make it. But what did you expect? It's a busy universe out there. You are the final authority of your own soul journey through the spheres. And, finally, the Black Iron Prison is a shitshow maze to navigate. But we're getting out, with or without the breakaway civilization technocrat. And our interview with Steven is another step. Another speculation. So let's reincarnate into it. Write your own gospel, live your own myth. I broadcast my revelation to the 12 states and four off-world colonies. And so to know thyself is only possible through the eyes of the other. The nature of our immortal lives is in the consequences of our words and deeds that go on apportioning themselves throughout all time. Reports said Commander Chang was killed in the assault. That is correct. Would you say that you loved him? Yes, I do. Do you mean you are still in love with him? I mean that I will always be. Our lives are not our own. From womb to tomb, we are bound to others. Past and present. And by each crime and every kindness, we birth our future. 
revelation, you spoke of the consequences of an individual's life rippling throughout eternity. Does this mean that you believe in an afterlife? In a heaven or a hell? I believe death is all you talk. When it closes, another opens. If I care to imagine heaven, I would imagine a door opening. And behind it, I would find him there, waiting for me. This is the Aeon Byte interview. And with us, we have the pleasure of being joined by Stephen Sacalarius to discuss his book, Reincarnation Can Be Proven. Welcome, Stephen, and how are you? I'm fine. Thanks for having me on. Pleasure is all ours, and uh, really enjoyed your book. And there's so much we want to talk about, including the documentary that I watched, which I also really enjoyed. I think the audience will benefit greatly from your work. But before we get started, with us, we've got the moon dog, Van Sachi. How are you, Vance? I'm fine tonight. This is uh, one of the first paranormal subjects I was ever exposed to when I was a kid. So, oh, wow. a long history with this. So, I'm going to be interested in what we're going to be talking about tonight. Well, wonderful. Hope to hear your insights too, if we can, because there's a, a lot to unpack and uh, insights galore from everywhere. So, Stephen, let's talk about you and your journey and your life. As you write in your book, Reincarnation Can Be Proven, you were originally, for a good part of your life, uh, as you write, you embrace a skeptical, materialistic worldview until your late teens. Uh, what happened? What changed? Well, uh, that's a good question. I think that I, I was a philosopher, you know, and always questioning. And, and if I went back very far, there were things that I seemed to remember that wouldn't fit with a materialistic view, and I never attempted to put them together, you know. Uh, like, for example, I always felt that I had lost a soulmate, you know, and that, that I had lost somebody that was, you know, like a, a, a special partner, but that wouldn't fit with being a child, you know, and yet I never tried to reconcile that. So if we go back even further, there was something else going on. But in my teens, I was definitely committed to the materialistic uh, point of view. And I was philosophical. And at about age 15, I was trying to create my, you know, uh, philosophy of everything. It was really psychology as much as anything. And over about four years, I think I got to a point of just being like tied up in, in knots with it, you know. Uh, and I finally just had to like throw the whole thing out. And then I, I really had what you would call a conversion experience because I started reading about Zen, a book called Three Pillars of Zen. And uh, I was meditating, doing Zazen, had a little stool, you know, made up. And for some reason, at some point, I just broke down and I prayed to God. I mean, I, it wasn't a Christian thing. I wasn't a part of any denomination or any religion. I just got to the point where I just kind of put it all out there and said, I'm a complete mess and I'm, I'm lost and I don't know what's going on. And immediately I felt God's presence fill me. So this is not Baptist. This is not Christian. This is not anything. <laughs> it's just a direct experience. And pretty much from that point on, it was like a, a flip. You know, there's this, this, you get turned upside down, you know, at that point. I like what you write in one part of your book. You write, uh, this is what separates a true mystic from an ordinarily religious person. The mystic is not waiting for death, but wants to experience the deathless fire. I love it. Uh, is that what you experienced? At that point, yeah. I'd never experienced anything like that before. I had no idea, you know, but I, I recognized it as soon as I felt it, yeah. And you were raised in what, a uh, Christian denomination? I was really raised by, I mean, to be charitable, I was raised as an agnostic, but by two parents who had rejected religion for different reasons. You know, there's classic reasons to reject religion, and each of them had one of those. So my mother had been brought up in a very strictly Christian household, and she had seen that uh, Christianity could be hypocritical. So her comment was, you could use the Bible to prove anything. That's what she used to say. And she had just rejected the whole thing. Well, my father had been through uh, the Depression. He'd been through World War II. Uh, he was on the 
uh, he was a radio operator in the Merchant Marine on the convoys that brought supplies over to Europe, and he saw ships being sunk by submarines all around him, you know. So he had seen so much suffering in the world, he couldn't accept that there could be a loving God if there was all this, you know, terrible suffering that God could permit these things. So each of them had rejected God for different reasons, and I was brought up in that atmosphere. So your dad was more or less the Gnostic in the family. He, he rejected the God of the Old Testament and the evil world we live in. <laughs> I, yeah, I guess you could say that, yeah. And uh, after your conversion or your direct experience, your mystical experience, uh, did you start to gravitate to Eastern forms, or what was your trajectory after that? Well, I went through uh, the drug phase, you know, which I, I did because I had read people like Ram Das who hinted or flat out said that the drug experience was the same as the mystical experience. And I more or less had to prove to myself that wasn't correct. <laughs> I got through that. <laughs> and uh, I'll tell you, I mean, the way here's, here's one of the ways that I proved it to myself. I mean, I had an empirical approach, you know, so I knew that, uh, that the story of Christmas Carol was uh, represented the Christmas spirit to me. And I knew what the Christmas spirit felt like. And so I, I said, well, if I get stoned, and I go to a church and listen to a recitation of that story. If if I feel the same thing, I'll know that the, the you know the marijuana high is the same thing as the Christmas spirit. So I went there, and it was funny because I had long hair, you know. I guess my eyes are bloodshot, and there was a a minister <laughs> reading this story, and he gave me a real funny look, you know. He didn't say anything. <laughs> I remember his look. So I you know I sat there and very open mindedly, you know. It, went through that experience and I went home and had to sadly, you know, conclude that, no, they're not the same, <laughs> you know, the marijuana <laughs> high is not the same as the Christmas spirit. So that was kind of the start of that, you know, uh, discerning between the two. So anyway, what I did after that is I, I, I came away with the conviction that each of the main religions started with a founder and that founder, the, the mystic, was experiencing the same reality and taught it from different perspectives to different cultures, but they were experiencing the same thing. And that if you got into the esoteric side of every religion, you would find basically the same core experiences, you know, related. So I started reading each of the, you know, the, uh, the Buddhist scriptures and the, uh, uh, the new Testament and especially the Bhagavad Gita. And it was in the Bhagavad Gita that I came across reincarnation, and I just accepted it immediately. It made perfect sense to me. And what about, you talked about you, you were influenced by philosophers. Any philosophers or psychologists that really informed your life or inspire you even today? Well, not really philosophers, but I did find that there were mystics in more recent times and, and uh, modern times. So I began studying. I think I did study uh, Paramahansa Yogananda for a while and then kind of drifted away from that. But I studied Sri Ramakrishna and his disciples like Swami Vivekananda. And then I ran across uh, Mayor Baba, who I'm now, I've been a follower of Mayor Baba since 1974. But when I first ran across it, uh, I read some of his discourses and immediately I felt this is the same authority as Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. That was what I felt, the same profundity and the same authority. So I became a follower of his. Uh, I, was, I also had a very interesting experience meeting Baba Hari Das in a retreat. Uh, Baba Hari Das was the yogi that uh, taught Ram Das on a daily basis in Neem Karoli Baba's ashram. And I met him at a retreat in 1974 as well. All right. Well, why don't we get to the uh, subject of your book, and that is uh, Matthew Franklin Whittier. Uh, how did you become aware of this figure, and how did he, again, really influence your life, change your life forever? Well, the first, the first inkling I had of that was actually before I found this historical figure, and that was uh, I released my documentary, which you mentioned, In Another Life, uh, in 2003. And in the course of releasing it, I did a few interviews, and one of them was a, a you know a, a online interview where she sent me the questions and I emailed back the answers. And one of them was about my own past lives. Well, I hadn't really thought about it, you know, in terms of having any prepared answer. But I sat down and wrote what I had felt for many years, uh, and one of them uh, was. I don't have the quote in front of me, but what I wrote was that I remembered being one of the romantic poets uh, 
not any of the famous ones, but connected with them peripherally somehow. Um, and that actually was Matthew Franklin Whittier before I ever found anything about him. So I wasn't looking for him. Actually, I had had a psychic reading and the woman had told me, you are a female writer of, uh, you publish serials, you know, every week or so. And uh, you came to some uh, public acclaim and uh, you were on the West Coast. And I, I got the impression from what you said that it was the 1920s or maybe 1930s. So every once in a while, I would get online and look for the names of female writers that might seem familiar. And finally, I found one that seemed familiar, and that was uh, a woman named Sarah Orne Jewett. But it turned out that she was uh, on the East Coast, not the West Coast. And she was, uh, um, oh, in the late 1800s, I guess, second half of the 1800s. So I got on the website for her and I said, boy, this really feels familiar. I, I don't think I was her, but there's something about this that seems real familiar. So after some time, I don't remember how long, a couple of weeks or something, I wrote to a friend of mine, a fellow named Jeff Keene, who was in my documentary, um, who seems to be psychic in an interesting sort of way, because synchronicity seemed to happen around him. I experienced two or three with him. So I sent this website to Jeff and about a half hour later he sent back and he said I felt just guided to this one page kind of deep in the website it was a member of her social circle they had a number of people that she knew listed and Matthew was down at the bottom the very bottom of the list um, and when I looked at the picture there's an engraving of him a three-quarter uh, portrait and it, he does look like me but it was the eyes that really drew me in. I looked at the eyes and I said, that's me. I felt it very deeply. And uh, all I had to go on here was the name, his birth and death dates, uh, that he was the brother of John Greenleaf Whittier. And it mentioned he was an author, but it didn't say anything more about him. But immediately I felt that that was, was myself and that was the start of it. So maybe we should talk about the life of Matthew Franklin Whittier and how uh, well, he, d he did live a remarkable life. Did you start finding these things about his history? Did you go down that road? Or maybe tell the audience about his life and how you started connecting your life to him or remembering your life. How many hours we got? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> it's I mean, huge. But let me, let me start with what you find when you first start looking. Because it's very interesting because it's real different than what you find when you dig. So what you find, first of all, is that uh, I don't know if any of your audience members are old enough to remember Jimmy Carter's presidency and election presidency. But he had a brother, Billy Carter, who oh, is yeah. mostly known by uh, for <laughs> Billy Beer. See? Yeah. So, you know, but he's not he's like, <laughs> well, I, I went to the Jimmy Carter Center and there's one I found one picture of Billy Carter and it is uh, in the cafeteria. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so this is what happens to the brothers of famous people, see? Um, on eBay right now, there's uh, uh, Samuel Longfellow, the brother of, of uh, you know, Longfellow the poet. And there's a photograph of him for sale on eBay, and it just sits there. Nobody <laughs> wants it. Wow. You know? so, so this is what you find when you uh, look up Matthew Franklin Whittier. You find that he's the younger brother by five years, born 1812. You find that he is known for having written one humorous satirical series of uh, letters to the editor by this fellow named Ethan Spike. Well, Ethan Spike, if anybody remembers Archie Bunker or uh, people in Britain might remember Alf Garnett, uh, a, a bigot, you know. And so that's what right. <laughs> Ethan Spike was a horrible, you know, ignorant bigot. And yet he was kind of likable in a weird sort of way. See, so it's an interesting character. Um, and I have reason to believe he was an actual person that Matthew met, but I can't really go down that road too much because there's confidentiality issues. But um, anyway, then you find out that Matthew is kind of looked upon as the black sheep of the Whittier family. He seems to kind of abandon the family. And then they say he abandoned his own family, his second family. And, uh, you know, he's kind of painted in a not real sympathetic way that he drank and, you know, was wild and so forth and so on. And that's about all you find. You also find out that he maybe wrote some poetry, but he was just a versifier. In other words, he just, you know, was a hack, you know, and, and one of the, the unofficial, uh, I think it's William Sloan Kennedy, his name is, unofficial Whittier biographer, says that his Ethan Spike stories aren't even worth the trouble of looking up, see? So he's really put down pretty heavily in the Whittier 
legacy. Well, what I found was that the Whittier legacy was primarily engineered by one Samuel Picard, who was Matthew's uh, son-in-law, and they were longtime enemies. <laughs> So, uh, so his, yeah. all we know about Matthew comes from the guy that doesn't like him. See, so that's part of part of the problem. So, uh, also, he and his brother were estranged. Apparently, uh, late in later in life, uh, they finally reconciled toward the end. But uh, so, I mean, he gets short shrift, you know. So that's what you find when you look into. When I looked more deeply into it, I found that he wrote a whole lot more than this one series, and. It took me 10 years to find it all because he wrote everything with maybe exception of five or 10 pieces in his whole life. He wrote everything anonymously. Everything is under pen names. And uh, I say dozens. It's really probably a couple hundred pen names over the course of his life. He would, I, I, I tell people he would use pen names the way people use computer passwords now. <laughs> and, and Two months. Yeah, and, and part of the reason was that he was very deeply involved in anti-slavery activities, including connections with the Underground Railroad, and so he kept a very low profile. And his backdrop, he was, for the audience, 19th century, he was from, uh, what, a Quaker household? That's correct. Yeah, John Greenleaf Whittier was a Quaker. He was a Quaker up until 1836 when he married a, a girl in an upper-class French family named Abby Poyen who was not a Quaker, probably she was Catholic, I would have to guess, and uh, and they disowned him. The Quakers disowned him <laughs> for having married outside the faith right, and for other, yeah. other things that they didn't mention yet. So, uh, so he was, but he retained the Quaker values, and in his writing, he would, uh, he would more or less preach, you know, the Quaker values, even though he really rejected the outer form of Quakerism as a religion. So anyway, I, I found 2,100 roughly uh, pieces that he published over the course of his life. He started, if, if my research is correct, he ran away from home at age 12, which is nowhere in the Whittier legacy. He began publishing at age 12 in 1825 before his famous brother did. And in, by, by 1830, he was a junior editor of a newspaper in New York City called The Constellation. And he was helping his brother get established by printing his brother's poems in New York City, where his brother was just getting them published locally in the Haverhill, Massachusetts Gazette. Matthew was republishing them in New York City. So it's exactly backwards. Matthew was first, and Matthew helped his brother get a leg up. See? So, so my <laughs> research is totally different than what the, you know, what the Whittier legacy says and I mean, they they know about me. They don't want anything to do with me. I'm pretty sure. You know, <laughs> nice people. I met them when they didn't know who I was, and they're very nice folks. You know, very likable. Right. And but, this research was you. This is a physical research. This is you. You saw his name. You found a connection, and you just started doing the scholarly route. And yeah, and of course with the internet, I couldn't have done it without the internet because in the days before the internet, you need you need money, real funding, and you need a team of people to go to all of these. Uh, libraries and spend lots of time going through a lot of papers and periodicals with the internet you know i put in like for example if i got hold of a piece of matthew's work that i thought was his and i wanted to be sure that it wasn't attributed to somebody else i just uh put in the search engine you know some of the lines you know uh, like one sentence or if it's a poem one you know line from stanza and it'll come up with it see that's how powerful the internet is for research so uh, I couldn't have done it without the internet, but there was also, you know, as you're in inferring, there were also a paranormal. Uh, there was also paranormal data that I kind of triangulated. You know, I used traditional scholarship, but I also used the paranormal side. But you always verified the paranormal aspects or intuitions, as you write. That's the whole point of it. Yeah, and and the method was okay. Let's write down that impression or that memory, date it and share it with somebody else because you want to be able to prove that you actually put it down on the date that you said you put it down. You know, you don't want anybody to be able to accuse you of, of working it backwards, you know, where I found the data and, and then pretended like I remembered it before then, you know, so you got to document everything. So, uh, so I did that. I was very careful. And the reason that my eBooks are so long is that I literally tell the story of the research, you know, on such and such a date, I remembered this and had this experience, and on such a, such a date, I found this, you know, in an obscure 
newspaper somewhere and so on and so on like that for like the first book is 2,240 pages, you know, but the, the track record is there. I can prove when, you know, when I had the experiences and when and where I found the uh, confirming evidence. And when were you pretty much a hundred percent sure that this was my past life? That is there a, again, a scientific where you say there's enough evidence where I can just, you know, I can prove it scientifically with the data. Well, it was cumulative. I, I used to say the proposed match for like the first couple of years. And finally I said, you know, it isn't honest for me to say the proposed match anymore because in, in my opinion, I've proven it beyond that, but there, there wasn't like, uh, you know, an aha moment where I suddenly, you know, cried out, I've done it. You know, it was just, it was, it was more, you know, understated than that. I just said, you know, I just can't keep saying proposed anymore. Fascinating. And it seems looking at the life of Matthew, he had a very, it wasn't traditional life. I mean, as you write, he was probably a spiritualist. He was influenced by Greek Stoic philosophers and later on became fascinated by Hermeticism and other things. So he was ste- steeped in, you might call it, the occult of those days. Well, it was Abby that did it. Well, it was he Abby, was, his, his he, was a, he was a skeptic. Uh, and he was fascinated by the satirists of, of England. So he'd studied all of the satirical literature, Oliver Goldsmith and a whole you know, string of them, um, and in America as well. So that was, and, and he had had a spiritual background, but really he was skeptical. And that was his background. Uh, and then, but Abby be- apparently became his tutor. I've had to put this together from a lot of different sources, but it, it looks as though. See, at age 12, he was starting to get published in the New England Galaxy in Boston, which was a rather prestigious literary newspaper of the time. And he wanted to pursue a career in literature, and he wanted to get a higher education. And apparently his father wouldn't allow it. And my guess is because of the two brothers, there was just two brothers in the family. And of those two, uh, Matthew was the able-bodied one. John Greenleaf Whittier had hurt himself. I'm guessing it was a hernia, but I don't really know. But he'd hurt himself doing some heavy farm work, and he was kind of sickly anyway. And Matthew was basically it, you know, other than hiring, you know, labor, farmhands. And it was not a wealthy farm. So I think his father wouldn't let him go because he needed him on the farm, is my guess. But anyway, Matthew ran. Apparently, they had a big fight. And I, when, I, when I say apparently, what I mean is that Matthew embedded his his autobiography in uh in hidden like code uh analogies you know in all of these uh humorous works that he did he's he's put himself in there and once you learn how to read his code you actually got his autobiography and you can put it together so i can see from that you know that he probably had a big fight possibly a physical fight with his father and ran away from home it shows up in his stories. It shows up in Abby's short stories. So it's almost for sure what happened. Um, and he, he, at age 12 and 13, he was splitting his time between Boston and New York City and uh, trying to work up a mercantile career and, and also like in trading and also uh, a literary career at the same time. But Abby was his teacher. I guess a lot of it was correspondence. You know, so she'd send him, you know, things. But she was the mystic. That's why I want to get back to that. She was the mystic. And uh, her mother apparently had taught her. Her mother was Scottish and must have taught her all of these things. And so Abby was a child prodigy in both literature and music. And she started trying to teach Matthew. So you can see that he was skeptical. He would ridicule these things at first. Like I've got articles from him. I think they're like 1830. And he's making fun of astrology and he's making fun of prescient dreams You know, these are the things that Abby was trying to teach him and he would ridicule him to the point where she actually began to lose faith in astrology because he was really a brilliant, you know, at debate. (laughs) And she was four Uh years younger, you know, so she was kind of, you know, helpless. But uh, but then he began to accept it to the point where when she by the time she died in 1841 of consumption, which is tuberculosis, he had really come over to her point of view and he spent the rest of his life. Uh, most of his life anyway, promoting those views. I think toward the very end, after the Civil War, I think he started to get skeptical again. 
But uh, didn't he become an acolyte of Emanuel Swedenborg as well? Or is that that's we're right, about Abby? No, that's that's correct. That was after she died. That was his first venture after the stoic philosophers he embraced uh swedenborg swedenborgianism i don't know if that's how you pronounce it yeah, uh and a... and yeah and then i won't say that twice it's too much trouble and then <laughs> and then uh, then he then he went into spiritualism so in the mid 1850s he's a member of the portland spiritualist association and uh writing quite eloquently I, he did a lot of ghost writing and i think he ghost wrote a a, a, spe- a speech and a um published pamphlet for the president of that association of uh, uh, in favor of spiritualism defending spiritualism against the mainstream uh, mainstream preacher in portland but uh, he did that for quite some years he also gave uh, spiritualist sermons apparently because he writes his brother about doing that yes and uh, but abby she is fascinating uh I feel maybe more fascinating than Matthew because didn't she, as you write, study under the Albert Pike? No. Well, yes, yeah, she was. He was her classroom teacher, apparently. Again, this is inference, but he was her classroom teacher. And uh, the mystical poetry that he is credited with was actually hers. Wow. <laughs> she was she was the author yeah and he stole it from her he he was actually a, a worldly guy you know he was a hunter he was a man's man he uh apparently drank and he became a uh, general for the south in the civil war even though he was a new englander you know but it was it was later in his life that he became a mason and became i think it was like a 33 degree you know top of the tier mason and he's implicated in some uh conspiracy theories and and some other things but uh There's a very interesting quote about him that says that a a New York newspaper man said that he was, um, I forget the word, but he was like an outrageous plagiarist. Well, that was, I swear that was Matthew, because Matthew was, in fact, a New York newspaper man. And he was in a position to know, you know, but he kept such a low profile that he's not quoted. See, but (laughs) I mean, he's not named in that quote, you know, but I swear that's him. So, uh, but, but I did actually find proof of this or near proof of this, um, in 1830, 30 to 33, but in 1831, I think this comes up, there's a poem signed AP, which is Abby's initials, but also Albert Pike's initials. And apparently what he would do is he would steal her poems out of her class workbook and publish them under their shared initials. So that if he ever got caught, he could say, oh, well, I was just publishing them for her. See, and if he didn't get <laughs> caught, he would take the money and the, and the acclaim. See, so this poem is called Ode to a Mockingbird. Well, it sounds like it's probably a homework assignment, you know, right in the style of Ode to the Nightingale. See, so she wrote this beautiful poem and it starts out being very much of a, a, a scathing um, view of cities versus, you know, country living. And uh, and very, I won't say moralistic, but a very high moral tone to this thing. It's it's deep and it's beautiful. And uh, uh, Albert Pike, to his biographer, claimed that he had written "Ode to the Mockingbird," and he said he wrote it a couple of days after his wedding. But he was married in 1834, and this was published in 1832, which maybe he wasn't aware of it. See, and it's a different poem. So it's been completely rewritten, but it's clearly the same poem. It's just been heavily, heavily edited and not for the better, except it's more consistent. But it's, you know, in other words, Albert Pike rewrote this poem, not realizing it had been published two years earlier and claimed it for 1834. Well, technically, he could have rewritten his own poem and made it worse. (laughs) (laughs) But apparently what happened is he he was, you know, he just got married. He wanted to impress his new wife as to how sensitive he was. So he rewrote Abby's poem, see, to show her, (laughs) you know, so he really, he he stuck his foot in it that time. It's it's hard to catch these people. You know, it's very hard to catch a plagiarist in such a way that you can really make it stick, you know, but that time I think I got him. There's other, there's other evidence of that. If we want to go into that, because nine years after Abby died, Matthew started publishing her short stories posthumously in uh, a newspaper called the Boston Weekly Museum. And a couple of them, he added his own introduction. He kind of sandwiched the poem in between a man writing to his niece, you know, and so that part is Matthew and the middle part is Abby's story. That's probably because 
she wrote it as a play and there was no introduction, you know, so he turned it into a short story. The other ones are he didn't monkey with, but they're signed AP. Okay, so and, and they're clearly written by a woman, they're clearly not written by Albert Pike. And then after Matthew died, the month after he died, there's a poem signed AP that's about someone's last days or hours, and it's clearly Abby writing like right before she died. You know, and what happened was that Matthew, when he was dying, he sent it to the editor and said, please publish this after I die. You know, so I've got enough evidence that I can definitely say that, that the bulk of that poetry was Abby's, although Albert Pike would mess with him. He would go in and add a stanza in between or he would, you know, write some of his own. And his style is totally different. It's very masculine and kind of rough and, you know, worldly. <laughs> you know, it's just, right. <laughs> you know, you can, I mean, if you know what you're looking for, you can clearly see it. So, I, you know, it's interesting we're talking about that because I rarely had the chance to get into it. But Abby was fascinating because clearly she was also a, a musical prodigy. She played harp. She had a beautiful singing voice and she played piano, you know, and there's quite a number of uh, her stories and Matthew stories that point to that as well. And her, this poetry was written when she was 14 and it is very sophisticated. Wow. Yeah, I mean, she really struck me, and I want to get into some more of this uh, fascinating or startling plagiarism beyond uh, Albert Pike, the famous Freemason, but I wanted to ask you, just for the audience, because, uh, for example, I have never had a past life experience. Uh, of course, I've had deja vu. I've, I feel a very strong, sometimes insane connection to certain historical mm -hmm. figures, but I've just never gone down that road. I've had visions right. in my mystic states where I've spoken to figures, but I don't say, well, I used to be them. So how does it work, Stephen? You've done so much research historical. You've had the connections. You've done the work. Is there a point or can it happen where you can recollect everything from Matthew as a total recall or is that just simply an impossibility I think you were you talk about in your uh, documentary the figure that you've been following Meyer Baba and mm. there's always going to be a wall between human beings and their past lives but is there a way you would eventually recollect completely the life of Matthew or is that just not going to happen well I had hoped it would happen it can um, happen. I mean, do we have examples historical with well, masters and gurus? Or what? What Mayor Baba says is that eventually, after a great number of lifetimes, if you uh, progress spiritually to a certain point, those lifetimes will open up to you just naturally. But I'm not at that point. Nobody I know is at that point. Possibly Hari Das. You know, Baba Hari Das, a yogi, was. You know, uh, he he certainly had the ability to look right through you. And see things like, for example, Hari, I, I, I asked him, how can I serve God? And he said, don't hate anybody. Don't hate anyone. He wrote on a slate board because he was silent. Right. So he wrote, don't hate anyone. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't hate anybody. I'm a nice person. You know, I said, well, that's not what I wanted. I wanted like, you know, a volunteer in a soup kitchen or something, you know. So I was so stupid. I mean, you know, I was I was young, you know, but I, <laughs> I asked him again and he wrote the same thing. Don't hate anybody, you know. And it took me years to figure out, you understand, Matthew was a satirist. He created some bad karma uh, uh, ridiculing people. I mean, he did it for good purposes. He, right. you know, ridiculed slaveholders and, you know, whatever. But he, but I mean, when you're using satire, you know, professionally, you're going to hurt, you're going to hurt some people. He was like, I don't know how many people listening are familiar with Lee Camp. I'm a big Lee Camp fan because he's so much like what Matt. That's what Matthew was. Was oh, like yeah, Lee Camp. Of course, yeah. So, <laughs> and I've got the, I've got the writing to prove it. I mean, some of this Ethan Spike stuff is very edgy, but uh, and including the bad words. Like one of my favorite ones. Uh, he talks about he makes fun of an astronomy lecture that's being given in a small town. He says science has riz. You know, we now have a lyceum. He's making fun of the whole thing, right? And at the end, he says he's these. These are the upcoming lectures, and his is going to be on office seeking. Well, that can be read either of two ways. Office seeking means getting like a, a politically appointed job, okay? And he was against that practice. So I mean, that's but it also means orifice seeking. 
<laughs> I love that, it. That, 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 that's like the dirtiest thing, but it's great, you know. And it got, and the thing is, that he got these things past the editor. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, that's not easy. <laughs> there's, another, there's another one where, um, oh gosh, I can't think of the name of the person now, but there was a, a fellow abolitionist who had written a novel, like a like a young adult novel. And in it, she had uh, the young man, a, a boy and a girl, and they're looking at this pond. And he, he says, well, it's just a small pond. It's not worth a damn, you know, a D-A-M. You know, yeah, I get it. The pun, I damn. love it. <laughs> yeah. so, so she was getting a lot of heat for that, see? So Matthew came to her rescue, and he said that he was at, uh, I don't know if it's pronounced Holyoke or Hollyoke, Massachusetts, where there was a big dam. And he says it's the best dam scene in America. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he got that published, too, see? And this is the 1800s. So he was he was pretty edgy. Now, remind me where we were going with this, because I've... I got yeah. I, well, I mean, again, you won't be able to recall his life, and okay, he was, okay. you, there was this clearing all this karma. What I was trying to say was that I thought for years that if I just immersed myself in his writing and in his life, that 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 would eventually result in some kind of a uh, you know experience where I would suddenly be able to remember everything. And it what happened was very interesting. It increased my subconscious awareness of Matthew in myself emotional the emotions were coming through uh i the more i read of his work the more i felt what it felt like to be him subconsciously that my subconscious was awaking awakening as matthew but cognitively no no matter you know and, and it was getting to the point where the emotions were too much because matthew was very discouraged with all of the setbacks that he had in his life and the fact that his legacy was lost and so forth and that discouragement was coming through with me i was getting the same thought you know feelings right so it, it, i was i kind of had to back off it a little bit right now i'm literally working within a stone's throw of where he worked doing very similar work because i know that he took tickets for a steamer that went from portland maine in the harbor to canada for a, for a while kind of he needed it as a side job right. i'm wow. taking tickets for a tourist attraction in the same place i can look out my window and see probably where he was and what ha but here here's what does come to you i look at the there's a series of uh like islands that you can see you know from the harbor and you know that the ocean is behind him. every single time i look at them i can feel what matthew felt you know, because he felt that the, the, the excitement of and romance of the ocean being just behind those islands, you know, I can feel it, but I can't get any more, you know. So what, what, what I found was as the subconscious mind awakens, you can do that and the emotions awaken. And the other thing I found by studying his writing is that my higher mind is exactly the same. No difference. I'm the same person. And I think that's true for everybody. And by higher mind, I mean my values, the way my mind works, the way my humor works. In other words, the the creative process of writing, you know, all, all the turns of, of my mind. When I read Matthew's writing, I know exactly what he's doing. I know exactly why he was writing it. I understand the deep story of what was what his motives were. I understand completely what he's doing. So that level of mind doesn't change. The only thing that changes is the cognitive memories and the physical personality, the, you know, the personality that's dependent on all of your experiences in this life that, that culminate and accumulate into, you know, your physical personality. That's a little different than Matthews. He was more sarcastic. He was cockier, you know, and, uh, and less mature, you know, so a little different. And he had a different, it kind of corresponds to his astrological sign, apparently, you know, he was uh, Cancer and I'm Capricorn, you know, and, and those are the kinds of things that change. But what I, what I wanted to tell you is that you are the same person, you know, <laughs> essentially, except for those two aspects. <laughs> so you would say, but between you and Matthew, there was probably other lives. I think there were a couple, but I can't prove it. I think there was that female lifetime uh, as a reporter and photographer. Uh, Matthew was fascinated by photography. He was personal friends with Ernest Lacan, who was uh, the editor of one of the first photographic uh, journals in Paris. And he would visit uh, he would visit uh, daguerreotype studios, photography studios, and he uh, did wrote uh, critiques about artwork and photography. So he was fascinated by it. Uh, I think this lady. 
uh, actually did photography. And I think maybe she even had some contact with Ansel Adams and Edward Weston in California. Um, but I can't find her. I know. I think I know how she died. I think I know quite a bit about her, but I cannot find her anywhere in the historical record, so I can't prove it. And then I might have had an even more recent one, a little boy that was killed uh, in the, uh, by the Nazis um, during the Holocaust. Mm, yeah, sure, short life. I think he was taken out in the woods with a group of people and shot oh, out, of the, out of the back of their trucks. You know, That's another story as to how I came about that, but I can't prove either of those. So then you were talking about the higher self. So you subscribe to the uh, to Mayor Baba's ideas that you have Mayor a drop Baba. soul. Yeah, Mayor Baba. Sorry, that you have a drop soul, a mental body, a subtle body, and a physical body. And the memories are stored in what the subtle body or the in mental the, body? The, the mental. Yeah, he okay. says they're stored in the mental body. I think they're also like stored in the brain, kind of like you download things from the cloud or whatever and store them on your computer. So I think it's both. Um, clearly they're not only in the brain because I can access memories that were in that, in that body and that brain is gone, you know? So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's interesting because again, I was, uh, watching your documentary and I, I mentioned this before, how we had the mayor Baba was talking about a wall to kind of protect us. So there's not yeah. too much a flooding of information and energies yeah. and all that, but that it's an, it's a fascinating wrinkle because obviously in, uh, in, uh, traditions like Buddhism or Gnosticism, uh, reincarnation is seen as a curse, almost a curse by the gods, eternal forgetfulness. <laughs> and the, in this one, he's, he, he's, he's couching it. No, no, it's sort of a necessary thing for the evolution of people. Well, I, I think especially for the long period of time when, uh, you know, Swami Vivekananda said that life is a moral gymnasium. So there's this long period of time where I think in order to develop moral strength, you have to take this world and, and your identity with the body seriously. Because if you knew that you weren't the body and you knew that this world was an illusion, you wouldn't take it seriously and you wouldn't develop morality so you wouldn't develop character i'm talking about building character so you have to take all of this in other words we're in the game to develop character you know but you have to take it seriously you know so there's a long period where it's absolutely necessary that people take this seriously and not remember previous lives because they have to immerse themselves in this one they have to get in the game in other words you know if you're if you're playing sports and you get in the game you can't be reliving you know, last year's match, <laughs> you got to be focusing <laughs> on this one, right? So, I mean, it's a kind of a loose analogy, but I think, I think that's why. Then gradually as you get, you've, you know, done your homework and you've developed strength of character, then you can start to explore these things and it won't sidetrack you, you know. And, and, and eventually the full memory comes when you're really quite advanced, according to Mayor Baba. Stephen. I'm interested in how you came to the realization that Matthew wrote The Raven as opposed to Edgar Allan Poe. Yeah, that's very interesting. Well, early in the research, uh, we're talking 2009, 2008, 2009, when I really first started, um, I had two hypnotic past life regressions. And some of the memories I had, I was able to verify to a very strong extent, which we can go into if we want to. Some of the memories I was able to verify were not from hypnosis, so I have some of each. But one that I had, which I wasn't able to verify at all, and it came completely out of the blue because I don't, I don't know anything about Edgar Allan Poe, or I didn't. I didn't, hadn't studied him at all. The only experience I'd had is when I was in grade school, we're talking maybe sixth grade, maybe age 12, and we had Edgar Allan Poe and The Raven, and I started reading it. I couldn't finish it. It was too painful and too intense. The, gr the, the grief that I felt, again, I, for all of my childhood, I felt on some level that I'd lost someone. And that became very articulate when I started reading this poem. I just couldn't finish it. I didn't have the feeling, oh, I wrote this. Nothing like that. It was just, uh, uh, you know, I just couldn't, couldn't do it. So I'd had that experience and forgotten about it completely. So under hypnosis, I rem suddenly started remembering meeting with Edgar Allan Poe. And uh, I mean, I still can kind of remember it. We met on the front porch of a cabin. And it was a, a wide front porch that went all the way across. 
the wood in this cabin was unfinished, like it hadn't been painted. It was kind of like green wood, you know. And we sat out there. And I seem to remember that we smoked pot in a pipe. I have no idea if that's true. But we it was a sense of kind of sparring. And, and the feeling I got that I reported was to check. We were like checking this guy out, you know. What's this guy about? And like sparring, intellectually sparring, you know, and, and talking. I don't remember sharing anything with him, or I didn't in the hypnotic session. Matter of fact, I remembered something about him recruiting me for ghostwriting or something like that, which hasn't come up in any historical, no meeting has come up per se. Um, and I, I deliberately didn't research this thing because I, I didn't want to sully the research. I didn't want to get personally involved in it. I had this kind of vague idea that it would be more scientific if somebody else researched it and I didn't get involved in it at all. And nobody else came forward to do that you know nobody's interested in my research except there was one one lady that helped me as a volunteer but um so finally i started looking into it but um i can't remember the sequence of events but s fairly early i realized that matthew wrote uh signed with a with an asterisk which was a star and it meant a star to him and what it meant was uh, he and Abby were both stars. Apparently, she loved the stars, and she wrote about them, and she believed that stars were living beings, conscious beings, or at least that they represented souls in heaven, at the very least. And, and she thought of herself and Matthew as twin stars, apparently. So after she died, in, uh, he had signed with this before, but after she died, I think he would write as the star as a tribute to her. So I knew that, and I'd found a whole bunch of pieces that he wrote under this pseudonym. It was clearly him. I'd already established that. And then I found these star-signed reviews in the New York Tribune, starting, I think it was November of 1844 in New York, and going on to uh, the middle of 1846. And they were some of them were like every day, and they obviously took quite a bit of work, and, were, and it was clearly Matthew's style, because I knew his style very well. This is toward the end, you know, of the research, and I knew his style, so I knew this is him. And then, come to find out, they're all attributed to Margaret Fuller, the transcendentalist. You know, so now I had my work cut out for me. I had to go through them piece by piece, looking for some kind of proof that it was Matthew and not her. It's very difficult to do because she's supposed to be a transcendentalist, so she's going to have the same views and the same values and everything else as Matthew, see? So you can't, you know, when, when you're trying to to distinguish his work from a worldly character, that's easy because you just find, you know, things that Matthew believed in that this person clearly didn't believe in. And, you, you know, you've got a pretty strong case with Margaret Fuller was a lot different. So I, I looked for things where the writer gave a little bit of autobiography where he or she talked about their own life and especially looked for gender references. And I found some of them. I don't have them right in front of me, but I'll tell you one. There's one of these. Uh, they're not only reviews. Some of them are uh, essays. But there's one in which the writer sees, uh, goes to view a really large ship. Uh, I can't right off remember the name of it. It might come to me. But uh, he is invited to go see the quote-unquote heart and lungs of the ship. Well, it's a steamship. That means he was invited into the engine room. And in 1844 or 45, it's extremely unlikely that a, that a woman is going to be invited to go see the engine room. <laughs> you know, it's conceivable, right. but it's very unlikely in that era or that she would want to, you know. So that's, that's fairly strong right there. One of the other strong things is that after she died tragically in a shipwreck, um, there was a memorial written for her and her editor wrote part of it. And he also has his own memoir. So between the two, what he's, the picture that you get, and this will lead to Poe, I'll, I'll try to be fairly quick about it. But what happened was, is that, uh, Horace Greeley, the editor of the Tribune, his wife was a big fan of Margaret Fuller, so much so that she wanted to invite Margaret Fuller to come and live with them. So that, happened and she's living there at the house but she's temperamental and Horace Greeley says he gave her this uh, 
the uh, literary editorship of the paper. He gave her a position on the paper, probably to make his wife happy. Okay, so but she was so temperamental. She she he says her output wasn't a was a tenth of his, and that she only wrote when she felt like it. You know, well, these star signed reviews are like every day or every other day, and they're lengthy, and they obviously took a heck of a lot of work. Right there, there's a huge discrepancy. There's no way she could be the author of these things. <laughs> You know, because she was lazy and didn't and temperamental and didn't right. write, you know. But somebody. See, yeah. So what happened was is that Greeley, uh, to make his wife happy, he gave her. I'm extrapolating now. He gave her this position, but he got a freelancer to actually write the pieces, <laughs> and that was Matthew, a freelancer who was willing to stay uh, behind the scenes, you know, and not a sort. So okay, so now we know that Matthew's, or I know that Matthew was writing these. Now we can tie this in with Poe because this is the same period that The Raven comes out in New York in a new publication called American Whig Review. In 1845, this thing comes out. Matthew had a, a, a history of contributing something particularly good to help launch a paper. Okay, So he'd done that before. Um, so not too long, like a, a month or so before, uh, first off, there comes a poem that I would say is basically in the same style as the Raven. It's called the might of words. It's signed M, which is Matthew's first initial in the, in the tribune. So, you know, already Matthew is putting poetry in the tribune. That's when I say style, I've had scholars say, Oh, that's not the same style at all. And they'll start to quote, you know, technical things. Well, I don't know anything about the technical analysis of poetry in terms of meter and stuff like that. But, Subjectively, it's the same style. Okay, so and it's and it's deeply spiritual. So then, just like a couple weeks before the Raven is published, we find Matthew as the star reviewing a compilation of poetry published by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, and in it he praises the poetry of Francis Quarles. Well, Francis Quarles was, uh, I think, sixteenth or 17th century uh, British poet, who was deeply religious and, and austere, very much in tune with the Stoic philosophers. You know, on, on, uh, if you take Christianity, which Matthew was Christian, and put together with the Stoic philosophers, basically you've got Francis Quarles. You know? um, and, we, and I know that Matthew very much admired Francis Quarles because way back in 1831 and 32, he wrote an article about him. That's another story as to how I know that and how I found that. Now we're going back to the era when uh, that was the same publication that uh, Abby's poetry was showing up in, like Ode to the Mockingbird. It's called The Essayist. Um, so we know that Matthew knew about Francis Quarles. We know he had a, an antiquarian volume of him and that he quoted him back in 1831 and 32. So now he's praising him again just before The Raven comes out. The Raven comes out in... American Whig Review signed blank quarrels, okay? And it comes out, that's February, the second edition of the American Whig Review, but in, I think it's the 29th of January in the New York Mirror, it comes out, it like, it comes out before with Edgar Allan Poe's name on it with a few little changes. So Poe scooped him, um, but it's in Poe's, paper that's the paper that poe wrote for the uh uh evening mirror okay so he apparently he's a reviewer he gets an advanced copy you know of the american Whig review he sees that the raven is in there he's got a physical copy of it that he copied from matthew or that matthew gave him probably back in 1840 late 42 or early 43 and he shows this to the editor and says uh you know i like, this is my poem, I'd like to publish it, okay? So he, he scoops, he knowing it's coming out because he gets an advanced copy, he scoops Matthew with his name on it, and he claims the whole thing. Now, Matthew can't come out and fight it publicly because he's deeply involved in the Underground Railroad and, uh, and anti-slavery abolition activities, which I can, I can prove pretty clearly. Um, so he can't come right out. But when Poe publishes his compilation, uh, The Raven... Uh, and other poems, Matthews goes into action and starts publishing. Uh, he he does a review 
of it. And in that review, he embeds a clear message that it was stolen from him. And then he does uh, parodies. In 1847, he does parodies. There's a whole bunch of examples, which I've got in a, a series of three videos that I put on YouTube, of Matthew basically making snide remarks and coded coded references to the fact that Poe had stolen it from him. Do you have a quick one? That's interesting. Okay, so the review is the, the best one, really, is the review of the compilation. And um, I don't have it in front of me again, but from memory, uh, he says in a general way about people betraying you. And then in the course of talking about being betrayed, he talks about uh, that Chanticleer turned out to just be a dunghill fowl. Well, Chanticleer is a rooster, but in particular, that's a reference to a fable written by uh, La Fontaine, who was who put Aesop's fables into verse, a Frenchman. And then I figured out, I, I can almost prove it, that Abby gave these La Fontaine fables, because she's French, remember, she gave these to Matthew as part of her curriculum, a part of her tutoring to teach him French and also to teach him to write poetry. Because remember, she was a, a, a prodigy in poetry. So he had actually... Um, translated these things many many years ago and he'd had his friend elijah wright publish them under elijah wright's name as the translator matthew always kept his name out of everything um so this was a reference to a particular a particular uh poem a particular fable in la fontaine's fables it's only two stanzas long if i had a couple minutes to fumble around here i could find it and read it for you i don't have it out in front of me but the first stanza talks about you know, Chanticleer, the rooster. Um, but the second one specifically talks about plagiarizing a manuscript. <laughs> you know, wow. so and, and this is Matthew's mm. style of code. I could I could cite you dozens and dozens of examples. This is how Matthew would. I don't know if he was doing it for himself, if he was hoping somebody would figure it out, or if he was doing it for posterity. But it's like he left a trail of breadcrumbs, you know, intentionally. <laughs> for, I think it would have been. It would have been more clear if he said something like, I'm not raving about this collection. <laughs> right, right. But, well, he, he, lo he loved puns, yeah. So, uh, but I mean, it's very clear when you, when you identify the poem from La Fontaine and you read the second paragraph. I mean, uh, I mean, here's the thing. While we're talking, I can see if I can find it. We may come back to it. It won't take me too long to find because it'd be worth reading because I'm not just blowing smoke here. You know, it's not like, oh, I think maybe this is about plagiarism. It is. Right. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. It looks like it. Well, we are coming to the end of the interview. Stephen, would you like to tell the audience where they can learn more about you on the Internet? Absolutely. Of course, you can find my book on Amazon. It's Reincarnation Can Be Proven. Um, and you can find my website at www.com. I A L dot goldthread dot com. And I want to mention that right now I'm uh, negotiating with my uh, hosting service. Apparently it's got too much traffic. They think maybe it's getting attacked by bots or some crazy thing. So it's been put on a service called Cloudflare to protect it from the bots. And that means there's a little splash screen that it has to check your browser. And what it's really doing is making sure you're not a bot yourself. And then after two or three seconds, it'll send you over to my website. So don't be afraid of that. It's not, it's, that's, that's the good guys. <laughs> but anyway, I'll repeat it. It's www.ial for in another life dot gold dot com. Wonderful. And as always, we will have it in our show notes at the website and sure. uh, YouTube, uh, everything else. Uh, we'll have the show notes with the links to your work, your book, and your website. But uh, we are at the end. First of all, Vance, thanks for uh, keeping us company on this uh, journey. Oh, um, I am very pleased to have heard all this, and my past lives are too. <laughs> and well, Stephen, uh, thank you very much for coming on Aeon Byte Gnostic Radio. Enjoyed your work and good luck with your future research. Well, thank you very much. I, I want to say that I think this is the best interview that I've done so far. I'm, I'm really pleased with it. And there you have it, my beloved true seekers. The first part of our interview with Stephen. Are you starting to remember your past lives? And please don't tell me you were a pharaoh or a French queen. 
Why isn't anyone ever a slave or a hemorrhoid in a past life? Well, in our second part, Stephen will provide techniques on how to recall past lives. We'll certainly talk more about Edgar Allan Poe and deeply about Charles Dickens and that occult treatise that is a Christmas carol. Just in time for the holiday season that is almost as long as the election season. Stephen will also discuss other case studies that prove reincarnation, including the science behind it. I mean, why do children remember past lives better? And much, much more. Don't miss it if you want to get in touch with all of your reincarnations or just aspects from other dimensions. Just become an AB Prime member of Patreon at Patreon. A mere $5.99 a lunar cycle. Or really whatever you want to pledge a month on Patreon. Damning your soul has never been this cheap, but you'll get your spirit back and maybe some of your past lives. Your support helps keep growing this red pill cafeteria. Please go to the God Above God Dad Cam for how to get this and all other full shows, as well as other wonderful bonuses. If you just want to support with shekels via PayPal or the U.S. Mail, head on to my homepage as well or just message me. And as I always say, if you've got holes in your pockets due to the monkey shines of Archons, let me know and I'll send you any show on the Karmic House. I can't do this without you, but we are in this together. Those of us trying to break out of the spine of the Ouroboros. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being yourself, your true self. Hello and goodbye as always. <laughs>